Hi guys and welcome to attachment lesson 5. This video is going to cover the learning theory of attachment. As usual we are going to start with the outline of this theory and then move on to a couple of evaluation points before finishing off with an example 6 mark outline so you can see how this would look in an essay. Before we get started, it's going to be really important for you to have a good grasp on the behaviourist approach, as it underpins the learning theory of attachment. If you think that you could use a little bit of a recap, the link should be appearing on your screen now, so you can check it out if you feel like you need to. The learning theory of attachment was put forward by Dollard and Miller in 1950, and the approach centres around the importance of food. Essentially, the approach suggests that infants learn to love whoever feeds them, and because of that, it's been described as what's known as a cupboard love approach. The babies effectively fake affection in order to get something. In this case, the babies fake attachment in order to get food. As per the behaviorist approach, attachments can form via classical conditioning and operant conditioning, and we're going to have a look at how both of those work for attachment. Now, if you remember, classical conditioning is learning to associate stimuli together so that we begin to respond to one in the same way we already respond to another. In this case, the unconditioned stimulus is food, which leads to an unconditioned response of pleasure. And the neutral stimulus is the caregiver. So when the caregiver and the food are repeatedly presented at the same time, which is unavoidable because the caregiver provides the food, the baby will start to associate the pleasure of food with the caregiver. The caregiver therefore becomes the conditioned stimulus, producing the conditioned response of pleasure. For learning theorists, the conditioned response of pleasure in response to the caregiver is love and attachment. Okay, so the baby learns to associate the pleasure of food with the caregiver, and therefore the caregiver produces pleasure. Okay, that should be nice and simple, just applying classical conditioning to attachment, using food as an unconditioned stimulus and the caregiver as a neutral stimulus. Moving on, operant conditioning can also explain the development of attachments and attachment behaviours. For example, Crying for comfort, which is a really important behaviour in building attachments, can be explained by positive and negative reinforcement. So, when a baby cries, the caregiver responds, usually with feeding. And if the correct response is provided by the caregiver, the crying is going to be reinforced, which then results in the baby directing their crying towards that particular caregiver, who will then respond. And that response is known as a social suppressor, because the response is suppressing the baby's social behaviour of crying. So that results in the baby receiving positive reinforcement for crying, okay, because the baby is crying and then it's getting what it wants, which means that the baby is going to learn to cry for comfort, it's going to repeat the behaviour. Um, but the caregiver is also receiving reinforcement, but the caregiver is receiving negative reinforcement because her behavior is resulting in the removal of an unpleasant stimulus, which is the baby crying. Okay, so the baby's crying is reinforced because it's being rewarded and the caregiver's responding is being reinforced because it's also being rewarded. The only difference is the baby is being rewarded with food and the caregiver is being rewarded with a removal of the crying. Okay, so this mutual reinforcement is really, really important in strengthening the attachment between the infant and the caregiver. Okay, and on a final note, Learning theorists also draw on the concept of something called drive reduction. So according to learning theorists, hunger can be considered what's known as a primary drive because it's an innate biological motivator. We are effectively driven to eat in order to reduce our hunger drive. Now, Sears et al. In 1957, suggested that because caregivers provide food, the primary drive of hunger becomes generalized to the caregiver. So that makes attachment what's known as a secondary drive, 
because it's learned by an association between the caregiver and the satisfaction of the primary drive. Okay, so that's kind of the, the one little bit of new information when it comes to behaviorism and learning theorists is this idea of a secondary and a primary drive. Attachment is the secondary drive because it's learned through an association between the caregiver and the satisfaction of our primary drive, which is hunger. So that was the end of the outline. Like I said, hopefully there isn't very much new there. It's all behaviorism, but just kind of applied to something new. So with a little bit of luck, that should all be fairly straightforward. Um, so we're now going to move on to a couple of evaluation points. I've got three or four points for you, but actually one of the nice things about these points is that you already know a lot of the research that's needed. So effectively, you can reuse some research that you learned in previous attachment lessons to evaluate the learning theory of attachment. So as an example, you have counter evidence from animal studies. Lorenz's geese imprinted before being fed, and Harlow's monkeys spent more time with the cloth mother than they did with the wire mother, regardless of who was feeding them. Okay, so both of those pieces of research actually show that food isn't the most important thing when it comes to forming attachment. It's all about comfort and security. And I've purposely not written out the full evaluation point on this slide simply because this is a perfect opportunity to actually practice writing an evaluation point using knowledge that you already have. Okay, so take your point as being something like a limitation of the learning theory of attachment is that there is counter evidence from animal studies. Then you can talk about what Lorenz and Harlow both found. You don't have to spend time talking about what they did because the findings are the important bit. That would make out the bulk of your evaluation point. And then you can finish it off by saying something like both of these findings suggest that food is not the most important thing when it comes to forming attachment, but rather comfort and security or something like that. Okay, so give that a go, um, and that'll be a nice little bit of practice for writing an evaluation point. Another bit of counter evidence comes from human studies, and again, these are all studies that you already know. So, for example, in Schaffer and Emerson's research from 1964, they found that babies tended to form their main attachments to the mother, regardless of whether she was the one who fed them or not. So there's a nice little bit um, of research there that shows you that food is not the be-all and end-all. You've also got studies like Isabella, who found that high levels of interactional synchrony predicted how good an attachment would actually be to the primary caregiver. Again, it had nothing to do with food. Both of these studies you know from previous lessons. Schaffer and Emerson was in attachment lesson two, and Isabella was in attachment lesson one. Both of those don't relate to food, and again, that suggests that food isn't the main factor in the formation of human attachments, but rather things like responsiveness to the needs of the baby. Okay, and then the final two points, we have some support for the importance of conditioning. Now, this point effectively says that it's unlikely that food plays a central role in attachment. However, it is possible that conditioning does have a small part to play. For example, babies might learn to associate feeling warm and comfortable with the presence of a particular adult. And that could then influence the baby's choice over who their main attachment figure is. Now, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with food, but it does suggest that conditioning in itself is something that could be important when babies choose their main attachment figure. So that means that learning theory could still be useful in understanding the development of attachments, but it just needs a little bit of a tweak because it may not necessarily be all about food. However, there is a counterpoint to that, which says that classical and operant conditioning both suggest that the baby is passive in developing attachments. According to the theory, the baby just you know, sits back and responds to associations with comfort or reward. But actually, we know from previous research that babies take a very active role in the interactions that produce attachments. And, you know, you can use any kind of research from previous lessons to back that up. You've got Feltman and Eidelman from 2007 who did research on reciprocity. That would be in attachment lesson one. You've got Meltzoff and Moore who looked at 
interactional synchrony and you've also got Isabella who looked at interactional synchrony. So it shows that conditioning may not necessarily be an adequate explanation um, for the development of attachments. Okay, so again, th these two points are kind of together. You've got a little bit of support for the importance of conditioning, but then that follows on nicely with, um, with a counterpoint. Okay, so I wouldn't use these points individually. I would probably just kind of make sure I always have them together because by themselves, they are just a little bit short and not very detailed. But together, they'll make a really nice evaluation point. And actually, if I was going to put these in an essay, I would probably start with this strength and then move on to the counterpoint. And then I would follow up with animal studies um, and human studies as well. OK, so that's just me personally. Obviously, everybody can do it how they want to. Okay, so those were your evaluation points. You've got three and a half, four points there, which should be plenty for any 16 marker that you come across on this topic. So just to finish off, I have a six mark outline for the learning theory of attachment. I just want to give you the opportunity to see what a six mark outline would look like, what kind of information you can put in and how much detail you can put in as well. So as usual, I would always recommend that you start with an introductory sentence of some kind. Okay, so explaining what the whole concept of the learning theory of attachment would be, the fact that it focuses on food, and the fact that it comes about through classical or operant conditioning. I would then spend most of my time talking about classical conditioning because there's quite a lot to say there, but also it's a nice opportunity to use your keywords. So things like unconditioned stimulus, neutral stimulus, unconditioned response, and so on and so on. The process of explaining classical conditioning gives you a nice opportunity to show off how many keywords you know and the fact that you can use them properly. I would then go on and talk about operant conditioning. As you can see, there's less detail in that, um, but that doesn't really matter. There's less to say. But what you can see is that I've kind of built in the whole secondary motivator and primary motivator um, in there as well. So I've said that the infant feels hunger and it's motivated to reduce the unpleasant feelings. And so it cries and then the caregiver provides food, which is then a feeling of pleasure, which is rewarding. And so it's reinforced, you know, and so on and so on. Um, and then I've also talked a little bit about the caregiver receiving negative reinforcement and that that mutual reinforcement or strengthens attachments for both parents and infants. Okay, so there's a, a lot you can do there. There's a, the, there's a lot of different ways you can phrase it. Um, you don't necessarily have to get the whole drive reduction thing in there. Like I said, I haven't even really used the actual phrases. I've just kind of alluded to the fact that infants are motivated to reduce their feelings of hunger, which is why they cry. So that's what I would do if I was writing a six mark outline for this topic. Okay, so that is the end of the video. I hope it's made sense. Like I said, make sure you understand behaviorism before you look at this. Um, and if you need behaviorism again, then the link will appear at the end of this video. Okay, if you have any questions, then please feel free to get in touch and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. I hope it's been useful and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.